Even though it was not the problem voted off the island, I'd like to go over problem 12 because it's the first time we've, we've had magnets in a problem. And um, as I work with individuals on this problem, I see that many of you are struggling to get the correct free body diagram. Now again, if you don't have the correct free body diagram on a problem, you really are wasting your time with the rest of the problem. There's no points to be had there. And so we need to be able to follow the recipe. Now, in this case, we're told that the mass of the business card is 25 grams, and the mass of the magnet is 50 grams. Now, folks, if you, if you get a mass in grams, you can't use that in, all of your, in any of your equations. Uh, we use kilograms in our equations. And so I've got to convert that to kilograms by moving the decimal place three places to the left. So that's going to be 0 0.025 kilograms. Be 0 0.05 kilograms. Now let's draw the free body diagrams. We always start with the free body diagram of the simplest object first, the thing that is touching the fewest other objects. In this case, that's going to be the magnet. Now, the first force I put on any diagram is the gravitational force, Earth on the magnet. Now, that's going to be the mass, which is 0.05 kilograms times the gravitational field strength, 9.8, call it 10, newtons for each kilogram. And that's going to give me half a newton. Now, many of you just took the 50 grams and multiplied by 10 and got 500 newtons. That should scream out at you. I mean, it's five newtons to a pound, but that's a 100-pound refrigerator magnet. That's massive. You don't want those on your refrigerator, OK? Now, the next thing I do if I follow the recipe is I ask, are there any magnets in this problem? Finally, yes. Now, here's how you deal with magnetic forces. The magnet and the refrigerator are attracted to each other. They're attracted to each other. One of those forces is to the left, and one of those forces is to the right. But I don't care about both of those forces. I'm drawing the free body diagram for the magnet, and the magnet is attracted towards the fridge. So I'm going to draw a force towards the fridge. And I'm going to label it a magnetic force by the refrigerator on the magnet. Now, once I've taken care of the non-contact forces, the weight and the magnetic force, I ask, what touches the magnet? There's only one thing that touches the magnet, the business card. And I ask, does it push or does it pull? It's not a string, it's not a thread, it's not a rope, it's not a chain, it has to push. Whenever one thing pushes on another, there will always, always, always be a normal force. And by normal, we mean perpendicular to this surface between the business card and the magnet. Since the business card is to the left of the magnet, a push is going to be to the right, okay? and it's going to be perpendicular to that surface. Now, whenever one thing pushes on another, there will always, always be a, no a normal force. There may also be a friction force. If there's a friction force, it has to point parallel to the surface, which in this case would be up or down. So, do I need a friction force in this diagram? Yes. Oh yeah, because this diagram is going to scream balance. That, that magnet's not going anywhere. And so I need a friction force. What flavor is it going to be? Static or kinetic? Static. A static friction force by the business card on the magnet. And by Newton's second law with zero acceleration up or down, this had better be half a newton. If this is half a newton. Okay? Notice I didn't use any static friction formula to get that. I use Newton's second law. Now we go to the formula or the free body diagram for the business card. The first force I put on any free body diagram is the gravitational force. 
that's got half the mass, so it's got half the weight. Just a quarter of a newton. Now, are there any magnets in this problem? Yes. Can I put a magnetic force on a paper business card? No. I mean, if you put a paper business card on the table and try to attract it with a magnet, people look at you funny, okay? So, I'm done with all the non-contact forces. What touches the business card? Well, there's the magnet pushing from the right, and there's the refrigerator pushing from the left. Both of those objects are pushing. Whenever one thing pushes on another, there will always be a normal force. So I'm going to be having a normal force by the magnet on the business card. Well, I knew that had to be there by third law, because the business card was pushing with a normal force to the right on the magnet. By third law, these two forces have to be exactly the same size. Now, when this was on an exam years ago, the most commonly missed force was this force here. It's a static friction force by the magnet on the business card. And I know it's there because of third law. The business card is pushing up on the magnet with the static friction force. By third law, the magnet has to push back. Now pretend it's two in the morning and you've just been kicked out of the bar with your friend. Your friend is drunk. You're trying to get your friend to the car. You're pushing up on your friend to get him to the car. What's he doing to you? He's pushing down on you, okay? He ain't heavy, he's my brother. Okay, now, I take into account the push by the refrigerator. Whenever one thing pushes on another, there will always be a normal force. There may also be a friction force. Do I need a friction force? You bet I do, because this, this business card is not accelerating either, so its diagram has to scream balance. So I have to have a static friction force by the refrigerator on the business card, and by Newton's third law, this has to equal that. And by Newton's second law, there's no acceleration up or down, so this has to be 0.75 to balance these two. Okay? And those are the free body diagrams. Now I want you to notice something. If the surface of that refrigerator is perfectly vertical, it's the friction force and only the friction force that's keeping it up. In other words, if you could polish the front of that metal refrigerator so smooth that it was frictionless, there would be no magnet, no matter how strong, that you could hold your grades up on that refrigerator with. They would slide down to the floor uh, with an acceleration. Okay, so it's the nooks and crannies uh, between the refrigerator and the business card that are holding things up there. Questions on that problem? Okay. Now this week you were talking about the tension force. You drew free body diagrams for that case where you had block A and block B connected by a massive rope. Well, in the, in the tutorial room, we found this, uh, the big butcher block sheet of paper had this on it. Um, if a Tyrannosaurus is pulling Professor Steve Iger out of a building, draw the free body diagram for the building the Iger and the T-Rex, and will Iger survive? <laughs> so the uh, T-Rex serves as block B, the building is block A, and Professor Iger is the rope. Okay, just try to have fun with the class, okay? <laughs> now, uh, to get ready for this exam, there will be a review session next week, next Wednesday, here in this room, 8 to 9 o'clock. Uh, those of you that are going to the Tyson lecture might be a little bit late for this, uh, but I didn't get tickets, so I'm going to be here, okay?
Um, as I said, there are two sample exams at the D2L site. Uh, over the weekend, you should take at least one of those and grade yourself, see uh, how prepared you are for that midterm. We're going to finish this uh, gauntlet problem on Monday. We don't have time today. We've got too many things to do. Let's talk about uniform circular motion. What's uniform in uniform circular motion? If I'm going in a circle, what is it that's uniform? Anybody? What's that? Distance from the center. The, the radius, exactly. That stays constant. What else? Acceleration. The acceleration vector, I know points perpendicular to the velocity vector. Is that acceleration vector staying the same? Same. Remember, a vector has magnitude and direction. The magnitude staying the same, but the direction is not. Likewise, my velocity vector is not staying the same because it changes direction. So what does stay the same? The speed. Yeah, that's all we mean when we say uniform circular motion. We, we mean hit the cruise control and go around a circle. Now, in those special cases, we know that the velocity vector stays <coughs> tangent to the, uh, the circle and is always the same length. We know that the acceleration is always 90 degrees to the velocity, which happens to point towards the center of the circle. And this is the piece that we haven't covered yet. How big is that acceleration? Now, the first person to tackle this is Galileo, our genius. And he did it with a derivation that is so beautiful that it just makes me weep when I see it. Perhaps it will make you weep as well. Um, let me just show you what he did. He said if you're going around in a circle, your velocity vector changes. It doesn't change length, but it changes direction. It was that change in direction he was looking for. So he took the initial velocity and the final velocity and put them tail to tail. Now, he recognized that this angle here has to be the same as that angle there. Can you see why that is? Let's say that you're, uh, this is just a dumb example, but let's say that you're a, uh, an architecture major and you've got a T-squared, okay? And it's the 10th day of a 10-day project. You've been working on it like crazy. You've been building this great big complex of buildings and your roommate steps on it, <coughs> ruins it. Okay, so you, you go after your roommate. Now, if this vertical part of the T-square goes 30 degrees from the vertical, then the horizontal part of the T-square is going to go 30 degrees down from the horizontal. If that doesn't speak to you, think of the Grim Reaper. Okay? These two angles have to be the same. Now, what... What Galileo was looking for was this vector here, the change in velocity that happens in a time interval delta t. And here's where he was ingenious. He looked at this little curve, this little arc right here, and that arc is how far you've traveled in a time delta t. That's how fast, fast you're going, how many meters you go per second, that's how many seconds. And he said, this triangle is similar to that triangle. Now, most of us wouldn't have made that connection because we'd say, doofus, that's not a triangle, that's a curve. But our friend Galileo was brighter than that. And he said, sure, it looks like a curve now, but what if you take a very, very small delta t? No one said how big delta t had to be. Take a very, very small delta T so that my angle's very small. That curve starts to look like a straight line. And that was his genius. And then he said, if these two triangles are similar, then I should be able to compare sides. 
the green side of this triangle divided by the green side of that triangle should equal the long side of this triangle divided by the long side of that triangle. And there he had it, or almost had it. He was looking for the change in velocity divided by the change in time. He just needed to get rid of that speed there, that b. And so he multiplied both sides by b, and he got this result, which he recognized as the acceleration. And this acceleration we give a special name to. We call it centripetal acceleration. And he found that it was v squared over r. Now, centripetal is a Greek word for center seeking. And this is the acceleration that points towards the center of the circle when you go around it at constant speed. Now, that's Galileo's derivation. I have a derivation that's a little more loose, a little bit less mathematical. Suppose that we have some object going around in a circle. And I want to know what the acceleration is at that dot. Well, what I could do is I could take the velocity vector a half second before and the velocity vector a half second after the object is at the dot. Now, those two vectors are the same length, but they're not the same vector. They're not pointing the same direction. And I can see how different they are by putting them tail to tail. The change is what I have to add. There's the plus sign to turn the earlier velocity into the later velocity. Now, that change happened in one second. And so that means that is the acceleration, the average acceleration at that dot. Okay? That's what acceleration is. How much the velocity vector changes in one unit of time, one second. Now, what if instead of going 30 miles an hour, I go 60 miles an hour? What has to change about this <coughs> picture? Well, the arrows have to get twice as long, but what else? What else? Yeah, if I'm looking for a half second before and a half second after, they have to be twice as far away from the dot. So instead of this picture, I've got that picture. Okay, the vectors are twice as long and twice as far away from the dot. When I look at the change in velocity, I get a much bigger change than I had before. And indeed, if I'm careful with my PowerPoint, what I find is that it's four times bigger. So you see, twice the speed, I get four times the acceleration. And that's what this formula says. Twice the speed, because it's squared, gives me four times the acceleration. Now if I look at a smaller circle, a circle with half the radius, and I'm still going at the same speed of 30 miles an hour, well, the arrows are the same length, but the change in velocity from this arrow to that arrow is more severe than the change from this arrow to that arrow. It's on a, a more aggressive curve. And sure enough, if I find the change in velocity, it's bigger. And indeed, it turns out that it's twice as bigger, if that's grammatically correct. So for half the radius, I get twice the acceleration. So I get the same formula that Galileo got. And in my case, it was just me and Bill Gates being careful with PowerPoint. Okay? Mostly me. Okay. So centripetal acceleration, to summarize, is just a special name that we give this steering wheel's acceleration in the special case of going in a circle at constant speed. It's perpendicular to the velocity, it points towards the center of the circle, and this is the new part, its magnitude. That formula will be on the front page of the midterm, You'll use that formula in all three of your homework problems for the weekend. 
And uh, that's the only new piece. Now, I'm going to dim the lights and show you a video. You don't have to go to sleep, but you can. Uh, this is a, a carnival ride called the Rotor. You may have called it the Gramatron. That's what they were wearing when I was alive. Yeah? Yeah. And they get inside, and uh, then they get this thing going. As the rotor house begins to spin, what forces are acting on the people inside? Draw a vector diagram of the forces that are on the people as the rate of spin increases. Okay, now watch this, uh, this beach ball that Billy has here. Okay. Watch what happens. Notice how the beach ball moves. What is the direction of the resultant force on the ball? <laughs> okay. We get it up to speed. We drop the floor. When the final spin speed is reached, the floor of the room is removed. Describe what is happening. <laughs> Describe the motions that you see these people making. How would they explain the forces that they feel? How is their description likely to differ from yours, an impartial external observer? <laughs> That's a carny. <laughs> He's been on that ride a lot. That looks like a physics professor <laughs> back in the day. Okay. Now, we were asked, we were asked to look at that ball. As Billy was holding it and he let it go, it moved out, it moved to your left. Okay? Now, if we draw a free body diagram for that ball. We have the weight force down. What else? Raise your hand, brave soul. Yes, sir. The tension force, the tension force along the string. What else? Brave soul, raise your hand. Where are you? Yes, sir. You would have the, um, the force pushing against the, cir against the inside of the circle. Towards the outside of the circle, okay. How would I label that force? How would I, uh, what labeling would I put there? All forces are exerted by some thing, a thing that I can taste, smell, or touch, on some other thing. What thing is exerting that outward force? The what? The rotor. The rotor. Is that a contact force or a non-contact force? Okay, now I've got two kinds of non-contact forces. I've got the uh, weight force and the magnetic. Which would it be? Hmm. Weight. Not weight. The weight goes straight down. We've got that up there. Folks, if you find during the exam that you're having a hard time finding a boogeyman to blame that force on, then the force doesn't exist, okay? If you can't find a boogeyman to blame the force on, it doesn't exist. So that is the free body diagram. That is the free body diagram, okay? Now, if I take that tension force and I break it up into components, and I throw away the original and I just use the components, that diagram screams. But it doesn't scream out, <coughs> it screams in. Why would that be? I mean, we saw the ball move out. Why would the diagram scream in? Talk to your neighbor. Why would it scream in? Okay. I hope you said it was because the ball was going in a circle. And anything going in a circle has acceleration towards the center of the circle. If the acceleration is towards the center of the circle, 
by Newton's second law, the net or total force has to be toward the center of the circle. But Greg, I saw the ball move out with my very own eyes. Are you asking me to believe physics over my eyeballs? <laughs> Well, you were watching a video that was taken by a, 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 a camera that was going around in a circle. You were taking, they were taking a picture in a, an accelerated reference frame. We don't do physics in an accelerated reference frame. We do it relative to the sidewalk. You read the book, Jonathan Livingston Siegel. It's an old book. Uh, it was very popular back in the day very short book, it's about this seagull, and he just wanted to be perfect. He wanted to fly faster than any other seagull. The other seagulls were worried about getting food, and he just wanted to practice flying. And eventually he got to where he could just think about a place and be there. It was very mystical and spiritual, and every high school read it. Anyway, suppose Jonathan is flapping up above this rotor, looking down, he can look through the ceiling, because he's magical, He's looking for a target to poop on, okay? And what he sees is he sees Billy going around in a circle. Now, from Billy's point of view, Billy feels like he's being pushed up against that wall, like he's being just kind of squished against it by some invisible hand. But from Jonathan Livingston Siegel's point of view, Billy's being pushed inward. Billy wants to go in a straight line. That's how things want to travel. They want to, Billy, if we were to make those walls of the rotor in, instantly disappear, Billy would just take off in a straight line right over the popcorn vendor. What's happening is the wall keeps pushing Billy back into the circle. It feels like he's being pushed out, but in truth he's being pushed into the circle. If we look at that ball, that ball also doesn't want to go in a circle. It wants to go in a straight line. And so instead of the wall pushing it back in, the string is pulling it back in, back into the circle. Now, here's one more example. Suppose you and your friend are skating on a big pond of ice, and you're just standing there, and your friend comes racing towards you, and she screams, Make me go in a circle. So you see her coming really, really fast. So you dig in with your skates. And when she gets right next to you, do you push her? <laughs> no, that would be mean. You grab onto her and you hold on for dear life. And you try to pull her into that circle. It's an inward force an inward force that causes an inward acceleration. Okay? Now, for an object moving in a circle, the acceleration points towards the center of the circle, and by Newton's second law, the net force points towards the center of the circle. Now, at this point, I have to apologize to you on behalf of all the physicists that have gone before. We did something very, very stupid. We regret it, but we did it. We gave this net force a name. We called it the centripetal force. Now here's why that's a very, very bad idea. If you grew up on a farm, you know that if you name a pig, you don't eat it, right? Once you name it, it's family, okay? And by naming this force, for many beginning students, it became a real force. They start to think of it like the friction force, or the normal force, or the magnetic force. Those are real forces exerted by real things on other real things. But the net force is not a real force. It's just add up all the real forces. It's a vector sum. It's a mathematical construct. And when we named this net force, <coughs> people started to misunderstand. Now, I often cause problems during graduate level exams. I don't apologize for that. But years ago, I had a grad student that was having an exam, 
And I was having him at the board do a free body diagram for something that was going in a circle. And every time he put a force down, he said, what else? Put down another force, what else? Put down another force, what else? Finally, he had the whole free body diagram correct. Did I let it go? Did I say good job? Great? No, I said, what else? And he stared and he stared and then finally said, oh yeah, the centripetal force. <laughs> it's not a real force. It's not a real force. Now, if I look at this situation here, the net force is the vector sum of all the real forces. Well, this component of the tension cancels this weight. There's no acceleration of the ball up or down. And so the magnitude of the net force is going to be equal to that x part of the tension force. Okay? The x part of the tension force. Now, what about the centrifugal force that Madonna sings about? She can't be wrong about physics, can she? Yeah. There is no centrifugal force, regardless of what Mr. Wizard says. Now at MIT they had a special uh, private channel that MIT ran, and for most of the day it had homework help. There were professors that would work your, uh, your beginning homework, uh, the beginning physics, beginning uh, calculus, beginning chemistry. But they also showed uh, Mr. Wizard. And one day I was sitting on the couch with my, my two oldest children who were little at the time, and Mr. Wizard was at a, at a carnival, and he was on one of those loop-de-loop -loop, uh, roller coasters. And he started talking about the centrifugal forces on the people on the ride. I was off that couch so fast, I popped off that TV and I said, kids, you may never, you may never again watch Mr. Wizard. <laughs> now, as we raised our children, there were only three rules in our household, only three rules by which we raised our children. And that was one of them. That's how important we felt. You may not watch Mr. Wizard, okay? So, I'm sorry, what were the other two? No sex on the first date, and you can't date the same person twice. <laughs> it worked for us. Our kids turned out fine. Okay. You, you choose your own. You choose your own rules. Okay. Uh, we're going to practice this with an example. I have a bucket, and I have one kilogram of water, and I'm going to swing this bucket in a vertical circle, okay? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna calculate the force by the bucket on the water at the top and at the bottom. This is very similar to the problems that you have assigned for homework, and uh, you'll have at least one of these problems on the uh, midterm. So, There's the bucket, there's the water. Now, if we draw a free body diagram when the bucket's at the top, there's a weight force, and that's going to be the mass times g. What else? Well, there's no magnets, so what touches the water? The bucket. Does the bucket push or pull? Well, it's not a rope, it's not a thread, it's not a chain, it pushes. Now, whenever one thing pushes on another, there will always be a normal force. Now, this is a little bit complicated because the sides of the bucket are pushing in perpendicular to the sides. But I think we can convince ourselves that those are going to cancel out. It's only the force by the bottom of the bucket that's going to give me a, a net force uh, on the water. Now, since the bottom of the bucket is above the water, that force is going to push the water down. And that's my free body diagram. Now when I look at that diagram, that screams down. And that begs the question, if the acceleration of the water is down, and the water is above Greg's head, why doesn't it just fall down on Greg's head? Yeah, why? Yeah, why? That's what we wanted to happen. <laughs> Brave soul, why? Yes? Because the bucket is 
Well, it's the same thing with the ride. It just it's ever it's constantly moving around. Right. If the water were stopped up there, an acceleration down would say speed up in that direction. But if the water is moving and it's moving at a fairly rapid uh, rate, tangent to the circle, an acceleration down, which is perpendicular, is just going to change the direction of the velocity vector. It's going to make it go in that circle. Okay. Now, let's calculate how big that acceleration is. Now we've got to do some approximating. Um, we have this formula, v squared over r. Let's just, for the sake of making the numbers easy, take the r equal one meter, and that seems reasonable given the fact that I'm swinging it. Uh, so about one meter, okay? Now, we need to find v. So let's, let's assume that we swing that around once every second. In other words, I go one one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand, four one thousand, five one thousand, six one thousand. Okay? So given that I have a one second time of going around and I have a radius of one meter, what would the speed be? Well, I already asked, accidentally showed you the answer, so let's put it back up there. It goes around the circle, 2 pi r, where r is 1, in a time of 1 second. So if r is 1 and time is 1, that means the velocity is 2 pi, or 6.28, about 6 meters per second. Now, if I put that into the formula up there with the radius being 1, I get 36 meters per second squared. Now, before we stop, let's ask ourselves this important question. What is the total acceleration of the water? Is it the centripetal acceleration, 36 meters per second squared? Or do I have to take that centripetal acceleration and add gravitational acceleration, so I'd have 36 plus... 10 or 46. Which is it? Tell me with your clicker. acceleration, we use the operational definition of acceleration. And that operational definition is how much does your velocity vector change in one second? And so what I did is I looked at the velocity and then the velocity one second later, I saw how different they were. That change, since it happened in one second, was the acceleration. Now, at no time during that derivation did I care whether that was a horizontal circle like a racetrack or a vertical circle like a loop-de-loop -loop at the carnival. It doesn't matter. A change in the velocity vector is a change in velocity vector. And by Galileo's uh, deri uh, derivation, it's v squared over r. Now, if I look at that acceleration, Part of it is caused by this normal force by the bucket pushing down, and part of it is caused by the weight. It's the net or the total force that causes this acceleration. So it's, it's part of each. But the acceleration is just the V squared over R. Now, the net force, if I've got one kilogram of water, is one times 36 or 36 newtons. The weight of one kilogram of water is 10 newtons. So what's wrong with this diagram? What's the mistake there? How big should this normal force be? Yeah, it should be 26 newtons. It should be clear down to here. 
but we couldn't afford the bigger screen, and so we had to go with the mistake. Sorry. Now, what if I swing it slower and slower and slower? What happens to that acceleration vector? Gets smaller. And what has to happen to my free body diagram? Does this weight force change? No. Diet or exercise? And so that means in order for this diagram to scream less down, the normal force has to get smaller. And when that normal force goes to zero, the water leaves the bucket. So let's go slower and slower. Okay. One one thousand, two one thousand, let's go slower and slower and slower and slower. <laughs> I've got sponges in here, people. I, I took you for a ride. Okay. Years ago, we didn't have the sponges. We had this special powder. And you'd put it in there, and when you poured the water in there, it would cause the powder, the powder would cause the water to just go to a stiff, kind of like jello jiggler sort of thing. And uh, when, when Mark Baldwin, our demo guy, retired, uh, we hired Jerry, and, and the first lecture I did that with, he said, how much powder do I put in? I don't know, Mark always did it. So we didn't put enough in, and so I got this over my head and just jello all over. <laughs> it was disgusting, disgusting. Now, let's look at the bottom of the circle, okay? Watch how clever the PowerPoint is. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, the free body diagram, I still have weight down. The bottom of the bucket is now below the water, so it's pushing up. And my acceleration is going in which direction? Up. And so what's wrong with that diagram? Yeah, it's got to scream up. Okay? So let's see how much it has to scream up. The acceleration is still going to be V squared over R. If I'm still going that once a second, that's still going to be 36 meters per second per second. That means the net force is still going to be 36 newtons. But now it's 36 newtons up. The weight force is still 10 newtons. How big does that normal force have to be now? 46 newtons, 46 newtons, okay? Excellent, we're a little bit early, but we're out of uh, material. Have a great weekend, we'll pick this up on Monday.